Here on the blessed shores of the Western Isles, the elves sing many songs. Harps they play of ivory and tales they tell of mortal men and their deeds, both strange and sad. And a tale tell they of a mortal man who dreams. Many nights dreams he the self-same dream. He dreams that he stands in a country of grey-brown fields. But on the horizon a great wave rears up. It towers up to the sky, rushing onwards, destroying everything in its path. He cannot escape it. It will devour the fields. It will draw down this land into the abyss. And it will break down the road. The only road that leads to the Isles of the Blessed. Lewis and Tolkien. The Lost Road by Robin Brooks. The dreamer is old. Once mighty in law, he is now bent and crabbed. He goes no more to the halls of learning, but hides him in a den beside his dwelling, where once a gleaming chariot was kept, but is now a great store of parchments and of chests of parchments. For gold brings him no joy, nor the mirth of friends. You'll never find it. I will if I keep looking. <laughs> you have no system. I don't need one. You're wasting your time. Oh, no, shut up. You cannot command me, mortal. You do not know my name. You won't find it because it isn't there. Have a game of patience instead. That would have more point to it. Finish the crossword or start the crossword and then get absorbed in a doodle on the corner of the page and turn it into a Numenorean carpet design. Oh, do shut up. What are you looking for? Never you buy. Is it the proofs of the Ankranawissa? Have you dealt with them? Oh no, because looking at them put you in mind of revising your edition of Gawain, didn't it? And then if Gawain, then surely Pearl too. So then you looked at those, but you didn't finish them. Oh, no, you put them aside, because Alan and Unwin said you could revise your lecture on fairy stories. And you, unwisely, you very unwisely said yes. But is that what you're looking for? No, it isn't. I know. It's a letter. A letter of complaint. How dare they name a hovercraft shadow facts without consulting Professor Tolkien? Mind your own business. I know, let's have a quest. The quest for the bit of paper. You can be the quest bearer, and I shall be your faithful assistant. Servant class, bit thick, but salt to the earth. It's not that letter from the paper, is it? The one about the obituary? I would like to go on a quest. <laughs> I'd like to go on a quest to kill you. You have to find me first, little man. <laughs> You're under here somewhere. Ooh, look, there's a little door in the wall, just behind the filing cabinet. Strange that you've never noticed it before. Oh. Open it, then. It's very dark. Mind your step. <laughs> Mortal man is fallen, and his world is a fallen world. But that is his glory, for he will struggle to rise up again if he may, while we immortal elven folk may never leave our green forests. Who knows where men go when they leave this world? This tale begins long, long ago, after the Great War in the Age of Jazz. Yet the heroes of our tale heed not the call of jazz, although they are still in their time of youth, because they live in the ancient city of Oxenford. And many faculty meetings they attend, and vie doubtily for place and preferment. Tolkien, Lewis, I thought we should get better acquainted since we're in this thing together. Yes? I wanted to ask you. Yes? Look here, you weren't serious in there, were you? Perfectly. No one needs to study literature. No, they don't. Novels are written for amusement. Well, they are, aren't they? 
We won't count Jude the Obscure. <laughs> what do we study? Why anything? By rights, the English school should vote itself out of existence. <laughs> You're pulling my leg. Not at all. Language is the only thing. Sound changes? Anglo-Saxon? Exactly. Well, not Middlemarch? No. I can read that for myself. Thank you very much. <laughs> so who are we allowed to study? Anyone up to 1100. The Anglo-Saxon poets. The Edda. Their literature. After that, it's just books. <laughs> <laughs> What about a stroll in the botanical gardens? It's a beautiful evening. Eh? But don't mistake, I like the Edda. Of course, I've only read it in translation. Yeah. And so the fellowship sets forth. Whither are they bound? They know not, but they fare boldly together through grottos and groves botanical. What about the moderns, Eliot? No. Yeats? Not for me. <laughs> me neither. Who has ever looked at a sunset and thought it resembled a patient etherized upon a table? Not I. I prefer romance. So do I. Romance is... For romance, there must be a hint of another world. Mm, one must hear an echo of the horns of Elfland. And William Morris. Yes, or George MacDonald. Fantasties. Have you read Fantasties? Mm. Wonderful, MacDonald. A pity he has such a bee in his bonnet about Christianity. So does Spencer, I believe. Yes. There's a coincidence. Oh, and Milton. Yes, all right. I was warned to steer clear of you. As a philologist or a Roman Catholic? Uh, both. <laughs> it's funny how these fellows will drag Christian mythology into everything. <laughs> what were they thinking of? <laughs> Done. There's another. Ah, and Herbert. Autumn has come to Oxenford. And the leaves are burnished by the westering sun, glowing through the smoke and misty air. But as a pale daytime moon rises above the two travellers, they talk always of books and of the great magic stored therein. I would say the best romance is of the north. The north, yes. The northern sky, clear, cold. When I was a boy, one day, I came across Longfellow's poem, Balder, and it was the most... I heard a voice that cried, Balder the beautiful is, is dead, dead, is, is dead. dead. Mm, it moved me. I, I couldn't explain it. I got the idea of northernness from reading. Yes, not from actually going to the north. No, that's, that's just it. What is the end of their quest? Each seeks... A friend. But after the strange manner of these men of Engelond, they are so shy they scarcely dare admit even to their own secret hearts that they may have found one. I didn't get to France until November of 17. You're younger than I. Yeah. And I got my blighty one at Arras. Shrapnel. Still got a bit in my lung. You? Psalm. Wounded? Never a scratch. Trench fever. Had it for a longish while. By the time I was well enough to go back, it was all over. So many chaps gone. And the best ones. So much the easier to get a chair. I wouldn't have been given mine otherwise. <laughs> That's a very cynical thing to say, Tolkien. True. The times they stop at a homely wayside inn. <sighs> Perchance at the sign of the bear, or the bird and baby, and frothing flagons of strong ale are set before them, that they might fortify themselves for tutorials to be entered upon that day. Do you write? I've wanted to be a poet for about as long as I can remember. Anything published? Yes. Ah. A couple of years ago, a long narrative poem. Yes? Dimer, it's called. I, I, I haven't, uh, Lewis, I'm sorry. I, I... Yeah, no, no. I worked on it for seven, eight years, and it was my only ambition. Dent published it. And? And no one bought it. No one read it. It just sank without a ripple. I'm sure. I have to face facts. As a poet, I'm a failure. Some people, though, are born to write. Mm. Come what may, as... Trees put out leaves. Yes, but Keats's Nightingale. 
Hmm? Sings but to her mate, nor e'er conceives how tiptoe night holds back her dark grey hood. <laughs> but failures like me, we think we're singing, and night is standing on tiptoe to hear us, but actually we're merely singing to our mate. Do you have a mate? No, I, um, no. I, I have a mate, Edith, and uh, three children, one on the way. Golly. <sighs> Another pint? <sighs> Then they again fare forth. Three pints before luncheon have lightened their steps. Over cobbles, over gravel, over grass, ever before the fellowship, the road rises. Ever and anon, one to another, they open their minds more and more. My mother died when I was twelve. I was nine. Yeah. And two weeks later, my dear father sent me away to school. Bad show. Makes one a bit of a pessimist. Yes. It does. I'm not miserable by nature, but one can't help being persuaded that the world is a fairly regrettable place on the whole. Speaking from the discomfort of one's permanent employment at Magdalen College? <laughs> Quite. It's fine to talk. But always for me it's been safety first, keep the light on at night, stick to the beaten path. One gets glimpses, but that land is lost. No road back. Mm. After my mother died, it was all sea and islands. The continent of joy was sunk, overwhelmed like Atlantis by a great wave. What's that? Atlantis. A wave? Do you dream? What? No. Never mind. Neither speaks to the other of how greatly they value the sharing of their quest, of their company. Each looks forward to meeting, and ever and anon they meet. But speak they mostly still of books. Ella Arundel, Angela Bertast, Over Midden Yard, Monum Sended. Hail Arundel, brightest of the angels, sent to men upon Middle Earth. Well, who wrote that? Poet name of Kinwolf, 9th century. Oh, who's Arundel? Yeah, that's just it. Nobody knows. An angel, a star, Venus, John the Baptist. It's not at all clear. But when I first read the name, I felt a curious thrill. Arundel. I thought behind this name is something very ancient, something that leads way back, even beyond ancient England, something out of the deep past, Beautiful, strange. If only I could find out what it was. And at that moment, something inside me uncurled. Something woke up. And all this just at the mention of a name. So I thought I would try to find out who Arundel was. And when did this happen? Before the war. But during the war, when I was ill, after, after the Somme, that's when I began to write. What did you write? Poetry, mostly. Ah. And myth. Myth? I wanted to write a myth for England. England has no ancient tales. Not like the Edda, not like Iceland, not like the Mabinogion. Well, Arthur. Arthur is French. <laughs> we lost our myths hmm. when the Normans came. I wanted to find them again. But it meant inventing a whole world. The world before. I am, are your thing be cracked? No. Yeah. I've never shown it to anyone. Well, I'd like to see it. Well, I, I've read bits to Edith and, well, no one else has ever seen it. Well, may I? Would, would you show me? Is there much of it? Yeah. <laughs> On this day, they are walking in the gardens of Tolkien's College. Uh, yes, there is a fair bit. Uh, beside an old brick wall. I, I don't really remember a time when I wasn't working on it somehow or other. And in the wall, there is a low door. Are you sure you want to hear about all this? Yes. Lewis has never noticed this door before. It, it might be difficult to stop once I get going. <laughs> Please. There's so much of it. I, I hardly know where to start. The languages came first. Languages? Yeah. I used to make up imaginary languages as a child, but when I grew up, I kept at it. <laughs> Well, out of the languages came names, and from the names came stories, 
Then Tolkien opens the door. Myths. And they step through. And. Into another place. This is Middle oh. Earth. Oh. oh, it's glorious. There's the sea to the oh. west. And in the sea is the Isle of Numenor. That's Elvish for the land of the west. But it gives its name to the men who live there, the Numenorians. They are mortal men, but with a greater span of life than we. The mountains! Yeah, the mountains of Gondor. Yeah. Amundin, Elena, Nardol, Minrimmon, Kalinad and the Halifirian. And over there, to, to the west? Yes, from their isle, the Numenorians can see Tol Eresia, the immortal land. But in the east is darkness. Now the darkness will corrupt the Numenorians and bring about their destruction by a great tidal wave. And then the straight road that leads from Numenor out of the world to Eresia will be lost forever. This is astonishing. I, I've never seen anything like it. Now, to the north is the forest of Neldoreth, where Beren meets Luthien. Now, they go through many adventures, but are together at last. I, I've written a poem about it. I'd like to read it. It's a, it's a whole world. You've made a whole world. It all feels so real. It is real to me. What would you like to see now? All of it. I want to see all of it. Ah, very good. Uh, south then. Hold tight! <laughs> On an evening, the fellowship feasts in a great hall. Dainties are set before them, and strong wines they drink, vintages long stored in cool vaults, and they wax merry as the bowl goes round. I need some fresh air. Shall we have a stroll? Hmm. Tollers, I've started your lay. Ah, I sat up late last night. How far have you got? Well, Baron and his comrades have defeated the enemy patrol above the sources of the Narog and taken their weapons and gear to disguise themselves. Are you enjoying it? Oh, very much. The sense of reality and the mythical value. I made a few notes. Yeah. Yeah, well, you don't have to look at them. Honestly, it's ages since I had an evening of such delight. Benjamin's a damned little queer. <laughs> Orcs. What? We'll put him in mercury. <laughs> Orcs. Quick, in here. Uh, damned little Jew. Damned little queer. Put him in mercury. <laughs> What's that little door? Uh, Harry, come on. We're going back to the house. 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 house, 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 house. And through the door, the Fellowship find themselves in a place roofed with vaults of stone, where morn and eve men turn to the east to worship their hanged god, Christus. It is the college chapel. <sighs> I don't come here much. I know. <laughs> How do you know? Everyone says Lewis is a red-hot atheist. <laughs> Lukewarm. Where do men go when they die? We elves are immortal, condemned to walk the green forests of the earth forever. But the journey of each mortal man has an end, and then he goes, we know not where. It is a grief to us, and we envy men, for they that live may sing, but they may also suffer. And for men, both song and suffering will cease. I don't believe in nothing. I feel there is something. I told you I get glimpses. But, oh, you know, I can't swallow the whole idea of the redemption. How can you say that the death of Christ redeemed us? How can you say that it brought salvation to the world? Such a thing might be necessary. <laughs> How can the death of one man 2,000 years ago, however wonderful he was, be a help to us in our lives now? I mean, except by his teaching and his example. Uh, the example business is not it. Well, it's important, surely. No, that doesn't go to the heart of it. That's something else, it's something very mysterious. Well, how would you describe it? Sacrifice, propitiation, blood of the lamb. No, it just sounds silly to me, or shocking, all that sort of thing. When you read mythology, pagan myth, classical myth, any myth, don't you get the feeling of something deeper? Something at the back of it, waiting to be discovered? Mm, perhaps. The gospel story is true. It, it, it happened. Do you accept that? 
I had a very interesting evening with Weldon a little while ago. <laughs> Weldon, yes, he's the reddest of the red-hot atheists. <laughs> yes. Well, we had a long talk about the evidence for the historicity of the Gospels, and we concluded that, in fact, the evidence is rather good. There's quite a lot in the Gospels that it wouldn't be easy to explain away. It's a rum thing. So then, now, I would take the myth of sacrifice, a sacrificed god like uh, Adonis or Balder. Yes. I, I heard a voice that cried, Balder mm -hmm. the Beautiful is dead, is dead. You don't mind that. You <laughs> like that, Lewis, don't you? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> so, if you meet the idea of sacrifice in a pagan story, you don't mind it. No, I, I like it very much. Yeah, it's a motif. Blood, death and resurrection. It runs through all the great myths, mm -hmm. through Boulder and Dionysius and Adonis. And the Grail, too. Uh, and you are moved by it. <laughs> Without knowing quite why. Uh, mysteriously moved. Yes. As long as you meet it anywhere except in the Gospels. Ah. Well... In pagan stories, you are prepared to feel the myth as profound, even in some way true, although with meanings beyond your reach. I mean, even if you can't say exactly what it means. Yes. But the story of Christ is a myth. I would say so. And it works on us in the same way as other myths. Yes. But with this difference, the story of Christ is true. A true myth. Who are these? processing towards the fellowship, robed in white with sad and serious faces. Slowly they walk, long the line, young men pale of face, and boys dark-eyed, weary at the day's end. Tolkien, Lewis. Oh, good evening, Infomator. It's a little late for choir practice. Uh, singing Compline tonight. Uh, oh, yes. I want them to run through the shepherd. Sorry to disturb you. No, of course not. You carry on. We'll just, um... The story of Christ is a true myth. Mm. So when we hear it, when we read it, it works on us in the same way as do the other myths, <sighs> myths of Boulder or Adonis. But the story of Christ is God's myth. Mm. The others are told by men. Settle down, please, boys. In the pagan myths, God's word, his truth, is translated by the imaginations of the poets. They try their best to find the truth. The Christian myth is like their myths, important and full of meaning, but it happened. It is true. I still don't see. Why must God have a myth? Concentrate now. I know we've had a long day. Think of it from the point of view of language. You call a star a star. What would you say it is? A ball of fire. Ah, but that is only how you see it. There are other ways of looking at stars. By giving things names, by describing them, you are only making up your own terms, invented terms for these things. And as speech is invention about objects and ideas, so myth is invention about truth. Mm. Now then, gentlemen. We have come from God. This means that the myths we make will be mortal, flawed, but they will also reflect a broken splinter of the true light, a stray fragment of God's eternal truth. Only when we turn to myth-making, when we become sub-creators by inventing stories, can we aspire to that original state of bliss which we knew before the fall. Hmm. I think I see. Myth is flawed, full of human error, often misguided, but it is the only pilot we have that will steer to the harbour we seek. In myth, we find God. And after that night, Sir Lewis feels that the scales are falling from his eyes. And it is revealed that under his travelling garments, all this while Sir Lewis has been cabined in a massy suit of armour. A sad burden, rusted, old and unwieldy. 
He has borne it for so long upon the quest that almost he has forgot that it encased his weary frame. But now Sir Tolkien helps him to unbrace, unlace, unbuckle and take off the thick plates and heavy mail until he stands, his burden lightened, his spirit freed and joyous his heart. The years pass. Eftsoon, Sir Lewis puts Quill to parchment. Books, he writes, of his fresh ardour for Christ, and his fame spreads even unto the new world. And the people of the new world send him words of praise, and spiced meats marvellously wrought into boxes of shining tin across the seas they send him. And these he shares with Sir Tolkien. Yet Sir Tolkien has written one book only, a book for children concerning the Hobbit folk, and some few words of praise he has had, but not from the New World, nor are any tinned meat sent to him. Those who print his Hobbit book are greatly desirous of another such work, and Sir Tolkien essays this task. But hard is the going, and dark the way, and now, the clouds of another war darken even the sweet meadows and groves of Oxenford. Tollers, you're quiet. Hmm. Is anything the matter? Yes, of course. Oh, I beg your pardon. I never see these things. Friends say to me about some chap, he doesn't look well, or isn't he looking better? And I never notice anything. I hope it's not mere selfishness on my part. I'm not ill. Oh, good. Christopher has been called up. Ah. I thought they said he was too young. Not by three weeks. Oh, what bad luck. What a ghastly age we were born into. All I ever wanted was a quiet life. They're not sending him anywhere yet. Well, being a civilian's no good. No. It was better to be out there. It was partly the mere fact of being in the army. I had no idea how very much windier the civilian world is during a war. A minute or two under machine gun fire might put things in perspective. Yeah. Think how much human misery at the moment there is around the whole earth. Mm. If anguish were an element visible to the eye, the globe would be entirely wrapped in a thick black cloud. I say, Tollers, your book is one of the few things that makes life bearable at the moment. Uh, that. When am I going to hear some more? I want another chapter. Mm. Have you written one? No. They're still in Moria. They're at Barlin's tomb. I can't get them out. That was so good. The Book of Mazarbal, the ruined chamber. I read it through the other night. It's rubbish. I feel quite sick. No one will want to read it. Well, I want to. I feel as though it's what I've been waiting to read all my life. I mean it, Tollers. You, you must go on with it. I wish I could write it myself. Well, I thought you didn't like the poetry. And have you cut any of that? Mm. Well, I want another chapter. When are you going to read me another chapter? I want nothing else so much. Christopher says the same. Well, then. Hmm. What about you? Oh, well, you know. No? Well, I've been working on something new, actually. Something? I could show you. Yes. But, uh... Mr. Lewis! Oh, no. Uh, what? Mr. Lewis! Orcs. Come on. <clears throat> He's one of mine. You go up to your room. Oh, yes, let's. Plowed his divinity exam twice. He'll be sent down. Yes. Just for a minute, sir. I want you to get him off. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Ah, here we are. It's awfully important, sir. Not now. I'm busy with Professor Tolkien. Oh, please, sir. There's some beer on the sideboard. No. Sir. Please, please, sir. Oh, for goodness sake. Let's go and sit in the bedroom. Did I bring the beer? Sir. Oh, that's better. Uh, have a glass. Thank you. Mm. You had something to show me. Mm. Yes. I say, where'd you get that wardrobe? <laughs> Is it new? <laughs> Not exactly. Well, it's enormous. What have you got in there? Fur coats. <laughs> Among other things. What? Oh, come and see. <laughs> You're looking after them for somebody. <laughs> You've come through to the back. What do you want with so many? Fur coats. Oh, I say, these are prickly ones. 
But they're, they're not fur coats at all. Well, they're trees. Yes. Snow. Yes. A forest. A forest in winter. Where are we? The land of Narnia. Why is it called that? Shh. Someone's coming. Who's this? He's a fawn. He's called Mr. Tumnus. Mm. This, this is a classical mythology. Yeah. Ovid? This is a classical world. Yeah, but, but he is carrying an umbrella. <laughs> yes, I've had him in my mind since I was about 16. Just the image of him. It's taken till now to make a story for him. Story? Yeah. Narnia is under the rule of an evil witch, the White Witch. She has made it winter, and it has been so for a hundred years. A hundred year winter? The <laughs> Fimble winter from the Edda, from the north? Well, if you like. Oh, here she comes. She is proud, cold, beautiful, and very wicked. She is the Snow Queen. Hans Christian Andersen, I suppose. Sort of. <sighs> Why is there a lamppost? <laughs> I don't know. It was part of the image, the image I always saw. A forest with a fawn carrying an umbrella under a lamp in the snow. In Narnia, it's always winter, but never Christmas. Christmas? You mentioned Christmas? Yes. <laughs> it's a Christian world? Yeah. There's a liar. Here's the real story. He is the true Lord of Narnia, and he sacrifices himself for the children. We don't meet him yet. So, well, this is allegory. Uh, not quite. What you describe sounds allegorical. <laughs> what it is, is that I have imagined a world, another world, to which our saviour might have come, so that uh, the same sacrifice is made, but in a different way. You might say it overlaps with allegory. Uh. How long have you been working on this? Oh, not long. I thought not. Perhaps we could come back when you've had time to think about it more. Yeah. It all just came pouring out. I, I couldn't... Um... I don't really like allegory. I'm sure I've told you that. I think a sub-created world must have its own myth. You cannot merely parrot someone else's. You're not inventing your own story with allegory. And invention is the whole point. Time must be spent. A great deal of time. And the details. This was where we came in, wasn't it? Uh, yes, just there by the lamppost. I know I can think of a reason for the lamppost. I will, soon. It's a bit of a mishmash. Fawns, witches. Christmas. Well, well, Spencer does this sort of thing in The Fairy Queen. Now, you know I don't like Spencer. <laughs> Uh, no time passes, you see, in this world while people are in Narnia. What is the derivation of Narnia? Hmm? Have you developed a language? No. Please. Oh, for goodness sake. Yes. Oh, Mr. Lewis. Mr. Betjeman. Please. Oh, would you put in a word for me? If you only put in a word for me. You're an idle prig, Betjeman. You'd have only got a third anyhow. Go away and do something useful with your life. <laughs> Winter comes to Oxenford, then spring and summer. Young men and maidens come and go, but the shaggy oaks and the sandstone walls persist, and so do the tutors, growing older and shaggier Tollers! as the world of men grows old. Tollers! Uh, Jack! Mm. How are you? I haven't seen you in the... Fine, fine. Yeah. What news? Uh, about what? Well, the Lord of the Rings. It's an excellent title. Well, if you like the title, you can think of two more. Mm. Unwin won't publish it in one go. Oh. He wants to hack it up into three volumes. <laughs> and... I, I, I suppose the expense. Uh, hang the expense. I, I didn't write three books. I, I wrote one. <laughs> Still. I said no. Yeah, yeah. Maybe he'll come round. No. He said no, too. It'll mm. never be published. <laughs> come, come. I knew it wouldn't. I don't care. Yeah, how's your... that country? Well, Narnia. Uh, written any more? Well, they want some more. Well, when will you do that? I've done it. I, I've written two more. Bloody hell. I think there'll be seven altogether. Well, 
I admire your industry. Perhaps it's as well we're not both publishing. Paper stocks wouldn't stand it. No. <laughs> one of the reasons, I think, one of the reasons I've been writing it is because we haven't been seeing so much of each other. I haven't had you to talk to, and so I've been thinking a lot about what we said, about what you said, for instance, that night in the chapel and, and after, that there are ways of telling the truth other than by argument, with story, myth. Uh, I'm not a critic. So, Tollers, it's all right. You are a born critic. I, I'm not. It's worse when another writer comes close to what one is doing. But it's I... like a short circuit. There's a, there's a, a, a flash and a bang and a, a bad smell. I'm sorry. Uh, it's not your fault. <clears throat> so, are you going to Merton? Do you have time for a drink? Uh, no, Edith's not well. I'm oh. running errands. Oh. Bird and baby later. I'll be lunching, I should think. Um, yeah. Well, perhaps I'll see you later, then. Mm -hmm. One goes this way. One goes that as each man chooses. Evil is at work in the company. Dollars! The fellowship is breaking. Dollars! Dollars! Mm. You weren't at the meeting. No. You, you were missed. Uh, not by many, I don't expect. Well, I missed you. <sighs> Tollers. I hear you're married. Mm. I'm sorry we didn't invite you to the wedding. We kept it quiet because... I wouldn't have come anyway. She's a divorced woman. In my eyes, you're not married at all. We can still be friends. I read your book. Which one? No. So many. <laughs> the Four Loves. Ah. I read the chapter on friendship. We do not want to know our friends' affairs at all. You become a man's friend without caring whether he is married or how he earns his living. What have all these matters to do with the real question? Do you see the same truth. Uh, I'm flattered that you... You marry a divorcee and expect us all to be interested, having ignored my wife for 20 years. Well, I always ask. I ask about Christopher. And now you're married. Do you think we see the same truth? You couldn't even tell me you tied the knot. Well, she's very ill. I know. Edith met Joy in hospital, so... We know all about it. They talked. Really? That's wonderful. Go to hell, Lewis. <laughs> yes. Why are we shouting? What are you doing? There's something very evil under the floorboards. I'm trying to find it and Kill it! What? Oh, never mind. Where's that letter you were looking for? It's on the kitchen table. Thank you. Akuma, Akuma Lombigo. It's not a hovercraft, it's hydrofoil. As if he knew the difference. Get stuffed. Anyway, that isn't the letter you're really looking for, is it? I know what you are. I was in the hen run digging for worms this morning. That's all your kind are. I know where it is, actually. The letter you're really looking for. I do, though. I've known all along. What does one have in one's pockets? Hey. You put it there. As soon as you opened it, shoved it in like you wanted it, but you didn't. Breast pocket. Close to the heart. 
My dear Tolkien, it is my sad duty to ask you, on behalf of our house, if you would pen a short obituary for Mr. C.S. Lewis, whose recent death, blah, blah. Dear Mr. Publisher, I can't write Jack's obit, because we fell out years ago, and after he married that dreadful yank, I barely exchanged our word with him. Anyway, I've got a crossword to finish. I will kill you. You'll have to find me first. But there's a trap door under the rug. See? Lift it up then. Are you coming down? Yes. Mind your step. Have you given any thought as to how you'll go about this slaying? Do you have a bright blade of Gondor? Where are you? I've no weak spot, I'm afraid. No little bare patch beneath the foreleg. Where are you? I tell you what you need. You need a companion. When your warband deserts you, when your sword shatters, you need a shield brother at your right hand. Do you have one? What a shame. Where are you? I'm here! <laughs> What's my name? <laughs> And Sir Tolkien finds himself alone in a country of grey-brown fields. No. It is a place he has seen before. No. But only in his dreams. The wave! The At long last, he comes to the surface. He is in the sea, alone, salt in his eyes. Ahead, a curtain of rain rolls back, giving a glimpse of white shores and a far green country under a swift sunrise. He swims for the land. There all the golden codgers lay. The silver dew and the great water sighed for love, and the wind sighed too. Bloody Yates, they quote him constantly here. Jack! Tollers, it's lovely to see you. I'll show you round. Joy and Edith are here, of course. Come for a stroll. Oh, up you come. <sighs> Thank you. Mind you. They quote Elliot, too. And guess who? Betjeman. Oh, Betjeman is very popular. Oh. <laughs> mm. They never quote our poetry, Tollers. No? Not yours. Not mine. Oh, well. Nary a line. Uh. <laughs> In Lewis and Tolkien, The Lost Road by Robin Brooks, J.R.R. Tolkien was played by Tom Goodman Hill, C.S. Lewis by Pip Torrens, and the Elf Queen was Hayden Gwynn. The Dragon was Carolyn Pickles, Betjeman was Harry Jardine, and other parts were played by Isabel Brooks, Arthur Hughes, and John Norton. The director was Jonquil Panting. <laughs>